So I will just return yesterday from Chicago, and it's a bummer because I never complain about the weather. I love the sun. I'm sorry. I always complain about the weather if it's not sunshine. I want sunshine. I want hot. I want to sweat. And I heard it was really, really hot the last this week. And I was excited for that because when I got to Chicago, it was freezing cold. It really is a windy city. We were freezing. And I was just looking forward to coming back to sunshine. And when I got back, this is what I came back to. So I missed the sunshine. I missed all of that. But the reason I was in Chicago was because thousands on thousands of people gathered from all around the world. And these are people who are doing this incredible work. They're working with the most vulnerable around the world. They're working with children at risk, with orphans, with uh, child, children who are uh, child laborers, with children who are in uh, human trafficking. And I just got to hear these amazing stories of what God is doing around the world. And it was just so moving. Um, they opened up the conference and they closed it by having some kids who have been rescued share their story. And I'm telling you, these stories were just amazing. Like some of the worst traumatic things you can imagine, just pure tragedy occurring in their lives. And then all, the, all their stories basically start the same. How, and they describe how bad, how disgusting, how hopeless, how, you know, they had no hope, no chance for escape at all. And then suddenly God intervened and he used a person full of God's love and they were rescued from a brothel. They were rescued from the garbage dump. They were rescued from the streets. They were rescued from um, hopelessness. I mean, you name it. And and then, then they shared how now they're a part of God's family. And there are some children who were adopted and they were saying, this is the first time someone's called my name. It's the first time someone looked in my eyes and told me they love me. It's the first time I've sensed like I belong. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful stories. And the whole time I'm listening to these stories, in the backdrop, I'm thinking about the Easter story. Because Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, when he's looking back at the cross, at the resurrection, at the empty tomb, he's looking for the best image, the best metaphor, the best idea that he could explain to us what this means. And the word he chooses is adoption. And he says that when God died on the cross and resurrected, he paid for our debt. And then he invites us into his family. He invites us to be adopted. And he gives us a new name, a new identity. We enter into a covenant with him. And he says, everything I have is yours. And I love you. I know your name. And I'm going to care and love for you. Because that's what the Easter story is about. And we've seen that that Easter story invites us, all of us, to be a part of that. To say yes to adoption. To say, yes, God, I want to enter your family. And that's like the overarching narrative of Scripture. But last week what we saw was that it's more than just overarching narrative. What we saw is that every single day, all of us, we make decisions. We make thousands upon thousands of decisions every single day. And sometimes we make defining moment decisions. Sometimes we, we come up to a crossroad and we have to make a decision. And the decision we make is going to determine the course of our lives. They're going to lead us in directions we either want to go or we don't want to go. And the way we put it was that it's the decisions we make today that determine the story we tell tomorrow. And that's true in your case. It's true in my case. It's true in the case of Peter and Judas, who we looked at last week. They each face failure. They each face public humiliation. And they each had a choice to make. And Judas made a choice, and now he has a story. And Peter made a choice, and now he has a story. And that same dynamic is true in your life. It's true in my life. That today, we are writing chapters of our lives. We are making decisions. And these decisions are going to determine the story we tell in the future. Let me give you an example to show you how that works. Um, about a month ago, I went with my daughter, who is uh, 15 months, Isabella. I went with her to this little kid's play area. I forget the name of it, Wiggle Works, Kid Works, something like that. And um, we went there, and this was one of those ones that's designed specifically for toddlers, not for bigger kids or big boys or anything like that. And they have like a minimum height and a maximum height. But I know that the workers are kind of bending the rules, and they're letting in kids who 
shouldn't be in this little play area. They're letting them come and play, right? So I'm there with Isabella, and I'm watching her, and there's this one boy who I know, he's at least 15 years old. He's got a mustache. I, I, I think he's got a mustache. I'm not sure. And, and he's just a big boy, and he is just like bullying, tramping bullying all these other kids. He's knocking them over. He's pushing them aside. He's just reckless with his body. He thinks this is like WWF. And I'm just like watching him because I know he's going to come and knock over my daughter. And I'm right there and I'm watching him. And he does it. He comes and he knocks over Isabella. And I'm like, hey, watch it. Careful. This is a little kid. I'm looking for his mom. And the mom is nowhere to be found. All their parents are on their smartphones. Don't do that. If you go for your kid, go and play with your kid. So they're on their smartphones. And, and, and I'm like looking around for someone want to help and nothing's happening and then he grabs a balloon and he gets his balloon and he starts hitting Isabella on the head with the balloon right and I know this isn't assault with a deadly weapon okay I realize that but it's my daughter I'm the father and at this point I'm just like mad I'm frustrated I'm angry I'm raging I, and I, I'm start thinking what can I do can I should I go over and just hit him with the balloon should I push him over should I give him a taste of his own medicine and and, of course, I can't do any of that. And then I start thinking, what could I do? And I'm putting all my brain power to work at a strategy of getting revenge on this little bully. And I think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get my son. He's a supreme yellow belt in karate. And I'm going to sick Elijah on him. And, and of course, I, I don't do any of that because... Years from now, that's going to be part of my story. A year from now, it could be, yeah, I was a pastor at Washington Cathedral. I got arrested because I was <laughs> bullying a little kid, a five-year-old. Um, so, yeah, now I'm doing something else. And I, and I don't want that to be Elijah's story either. I don't want Elijah to say when he's applying for colleges, it says here you went to juvenile when you were six. Yeah, my dad told me to beat up a little kid, and I did it. Cause I ble so I don't want that to be Elijah's story, I don't want that to be my story. And, and this is an obvious case, right? No one's going to go and beat up a little kid, right? That's just clear. But that same dynamic happens every single day in your life, in my life. Every single day, we're making decisions. Every single day, we're confronted with these situations. And some of these decisions are defining moments. They're major the way you're going to treat your kids, whether you're going to take a job or not, whether you're going to accept this promotion or not, um, how are you going to relate to your spouse. I mean, all of these decisions, trials, temptations, you name it, whatever it is we're going through, we need to think of them in terms of a story we tell. And for most of us, we don't do that. We don't connect the current with the future. We don't think in terms of, I'm writing a story right now. So what I want to do is I want to take us to a portion of the Bible where this main guy, that's what he does. That's what he specializes in. He is, throughout his life, faced with like the worst circumstances imaginable. So much worse than you and I can possibly imagine. But through it all, he always has this sense of awareness where he pauses and he asks himself, what story do I want to tell? And the decisions he makes are going to be his story. So he makes decisions based on that idea. What story do I want to tell? So what's interesting, what's so relevant about this guy is that there, we know more about his life. There's so much detail about this guy's life, more than probably anyone else in the Bible. And it's a story you're very familiar with. And if you've been here for a while, last summer we spent a whole month on the story of Joseph. So what I want to do, if you guys will bear with me, is I want to give you a summary of his life. And then I want to read five verses. And in those five verses, what you're going to see is that this young man, this 19-year-old kid, does something very few of us do. He makes a decision not based on what looks right, not based on what feels right. He makes a decision based on the question, what story do I want to tell? So, so if you have a Bible, I would love for you to follow along. Um, and here's basically a rundown of his story. When Joseph is 17 years old, a teenager, he is sold by his brothers into slavery. I'm sure all of you have had some level of sibling rivalry. Um, I, I doubt it went like this, right? Um, just this week I was reading um, through this book called the End of, Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. And I found one of my favorite poems when I was a kid. And my favorite poem when I was a kid is called Sister for Sale. 
and it's, it's, a per, it's a brother trying to sell his sister, and I was cracking up, and I was reading that to Elijah, and he looked at me like with disgust, saying, why would you sell your sister? Why would you want to do that? And I'm like, ah, you'll understand when you grow up. But it's a joke, right? I don't really, I'm not really going to sell Sarai, and I never thought I would. Well, these guys took it literally. They sold their brothers to a slave, and they made a decision one day that they were sick of him, they were jealous of him, and they threw him into a well. They were making a decision, should we kill him or should we sell him? And they make the decision to sell him. So they sell him to Ishmaelite traders. They take his famous coat of many colors, they rip it up, and they put blood of an animal on it. And then they go to their dad and say, Dad, a wild animal must have killed Joseph. And they live with that lie for 15 years. And we'll come back to them in a minute. But Joseph, meanwhile, ends up on an auction block. And he is sold in Egypt. And they're bidding for him and they're auctioning for him. He's going to be a slave. And he ends up as a slave to a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar is a very influential Egyptian. He's the captain of the royal guard. And he ends up in service to Potiphar. So Joseph now has a decision to make, and it's a decision nobody wants to make. None of us want to be put in this decision. And his question is, how does someone respond to being sold as a slave by the people you loved most, your family? And Joseph does something amazing, something very few people do. Here's what Joseph decides to do. He decides not to play the role of a victim. He doesn't say, I'm going to, oh, pity me, look at me. He doesn't blame others. He doesn't play the role of a victim. Instead, he makes the decision to take everything that's happening as if it's coming from God. He's confident God has a plan. So even though it doesn't make any sense, he makes decisions based on that idea. And last year when we looked at it, here's what the way Joseph put it, the way we put it, I mean. Joseph responds the way anyone would respond if they were absolutely confident. God was with them. If they were absolutely confident, God was in control. And if they were absolutely confident, God had a plan. So Joseph does his best. He has a great attitude. He works hard. Potiphar notices and starts promoting Joseph. Joseph is promoted, promoted, promoted until a couple years into this slavery. Joseph is head of the entire household. So it could be worse because he's still a slave, but... Um, he's not tied to a dungeon. He's not like suffering. It's as good as it can possibly get for Joseph. And right then, right when it's a turning, you know, to looking like it's going to be good, looking like things are getting better for Joseph, he faces another problem. He faces a situation that's a lose-lose situation. And he has to make another decision. And this decision's even tougher because no matter which way he goes, it's going to be bad for him. And this is what's so interesting, what's going to give us insight, is that Joseph, in the midst of this horrible decision he has to make, stops and does something. He asks himself the question, what story do I want to tell? So Genesis 39, verse 6. Here are the few verses I want to read. You can follow along. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. And with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So Joseph is pretty much running the show. He's in charge for this very influential Egyptian. And then the Bible gives us some details that are kind of like foreshadowing. Joseph was well built and handsome. So he's 19 years old. He's a handsome-looking guy. It's like, like let's say, Josh, right? Just imagine Josh, something like that. Um, just handsome, well-built, young. Um, or Keith over here who just dedicated the baby, right? Handsome. Can, you, can you guys stand up for me? I'm just kidding, don't. But um, young man, handsome, and things are going well. And then that's when this happens, verse 7. After a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph. And said, come to bed with me. That doesn't mean like a sleepover. That's not what she's talking about. This is something completely different. And Joseph, verse 8 says, but he refused. He refused. He said no. Now to put this in proper context, I have to say this. We don't know what she looked like, right? I mean, (laughs) the Bible is very clear that Joseph is handsome. And good looking, and the Bible is very 
clear on the omission. Doesn't say anything about her, right? So she could be a beautiful Hollywood actress. She could not be. And we don't know. So I just want, I had to say that because we don't know. All we know is that she is in charge. She's the boss. She's like the wife to the boss who owns Joseph property. And she has control over him, right? So I asked Pastor Tim if I could do a reenactment of this. And he said no. And I asked him if I can do like with finger puppets and have Joseph running away naked. But he said no. So you just have to imagine what's happening. But the point of all of this is here's what I don't want you to miss. Joseph applies this question to this dilemma. What story do I want to tell? And he's thinking himself. He's thinking internally. If I say yes, not only am I sinning against God and doing something that's wrong against God's laws, someone's going to find out. I'm going to get in trouble. She's going to get sick of me and I'm going to be doomed. But if I say no, she's going to get embarrassed and she'll be feeling shame and she has control of my life and I'll be doomed. So I don't have any option here. No matter which way I go, I am in trouble and at this point, Joseph does this. And this is what I don't want you to miss. Here's what Joseph does. He rehearses his story out loud. He says his story out loud, using his mouth, not internally. He doesn't write it down in a journal. Out loud, he practices, he rehearses his story out loud. And here's what he says. He says, ma'am, listen, I was kidnapped I was sold. I was bought by your husband. I was cleaning out barns. And then I did a good job and I was cleaning out bigger barns. And then I was in charge of the guys cleaning out barns. Your husband has entrusted me with everything. So what's he doing? He's rehearsing his story out loud. Because the issue for Joseph is the same one for us. Which of the options facing us? is most consistent with the story I want to tell. So here's what the Bible says. Here's what he says. With me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you. Why? Because you're his wife. Wife, by the way, lady, you have a story too. And the decision you're going to, about to make, it's going to become a permanent part of your story. She doesn't care. But for Joseph, here's what he's doing. He's saying his story out loud. And then he ends with a question that's so relevant to, to those of us who are following Jesus. If you're thinking that God cares about the details of your lives, here's the question Joseph says. How then... Could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Why? In light of my story so far, the story I just said out loud, why would I want to add this chapter to my story? In light of God's providential care for me, in light of the fact that things have not gone well, bad things have happened to me, but in light of the fact that God has been with me, he's been faithful, he's rescued me, in light of the fact that your husband treats me so well, why would I want to do this? So he says, no, I can't do this. It's inconsistent with the story I want to tell. So verse 10 says that though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. See, Joseph has one of two stories he's going to tell. And the decision he makes will become a permanent part of the story. See, story one is God rescued me from a difficult time. Potiphar entrusted me with everything. So what did I do? I had an affair with his wife. You see, that's not the story he wants to tell. Instead, he wants to tell the story too. God rescued me from a difficult time. Potiphar entrusted me with everything. And when his wife tempted me, I decided to refuse her advances. Even though I knew it would cost me. Even though it was a difficult decision because that's not the story I want to tell. So he stops and he asks himself, what's the story I want to tell? What's the story you want to tell because every decision you make, it becomes a part of your story. 
And no matter what you're going through right now, as big, as bold, as complicated as it is right now, in a few years, I promise you, it's going to be nothing else than part of your story. A few sentences in your story. Well, little did Joseph know that he was going to have to rehearse his story two to three more times in his life. Because what happens? He's framed, he's accused of rape, and Potiphar throws him into the dungeon. And in the dungeon, he meets two guys who work for Potiphar. And what's he do? He tells those two guys his story. He tells them everything. He says, hey, guys, listen, I was kidnapped. I was sold as a slave. I worked for Potiphar. I did nothing wrong. I can tell you my whole story. I don't have to lie. I don't have to embellish. I don't have to, you know, say some things, you know, not say some things in my story. I can tell you my whole story. I don't deserve to be here. Would you help me get out of here? They say they'll help, and two years later, when Pharaoh has a dream, the guy tells him, I know a guy who can interpret dreams. And Pharaoh says, bring me that young man to me. And what's Joseph do when he's before Pharaoh? He rehearses his story aloud again. He says, Pharaoh, listen, I was kidnapped. I was sold as a slave to Potiphar. I worked for him. I did nothing wrong. I don't deserve to be in that dungeon. He tells his story out loud again. Pharaoh notices something unusual about this young man. And by the end of that story, Joseph is set to be prime minister of all of Egypt, number two in the land, from a slave to prime minister. Why? Because when Joseph was faced with a no-win situation, he stopped and he asked himself, what story do I want to tell? If I have two options, which of these options is most consistent with the story I want to tell. And what's so interesting about this story is the reason it's so multifaceted is because his brothers have a story to tell too, don't they? And for 15 years, they've been telling the story to their dad. And if you were to ask them, what's your story? They would say, listen, we were so jealous of our little brother that we sold him for some money to slavers. And then we went and we went to our dad and we lied to our dad. And he was heartbroken. We broke our father's heart. He would cry. And it just wasn't a moment in time. It wasn't one time. We had to lie to our dad over and over. For 15 years, there was an empty seat at the table. And our dad would cry and we would have to look him in the eye and lie over and over. Joseph's birthday, we'd have to lie because we were so jealous. And that's not the story you want to tell. But that's the decisions they made. So that's the story they told. When I was, whenever I'm working on these messages, I'm always sharing it with my family. And this is how I put it to Elijah. When I was working a couple weeks ago, I told him, Elijah, don't ever opt for anything that makes you a liar for the rest of your life. Because we all know there's decisions we can make where, where things look good, the profits look good, the, the pleasures look good, everything seems right. But we know if we make that decision, it's going to make us a liar for the rest of our life. And that's what these guys did. They made a decision that became part of their story and they had to lie for 15 years. And the story doesn't end there, does it? Because the brothers face famine, they need food, so they go to Egypt to get food. And now who's in charge? Joseph, the very brother they sold. And now the, Joseph recognizes his brothers. His brothers don't recognize him. And now Joseph again has to face and make another decision, a tough decision. He has to ask himself, what do I do with my lying, deceiving, conniving, father's heart breaking brothers? What do I do? And again, whatever decision Joseph makes will become a permanent part of the story. So Joseph has one of two options. What does he want his story to be? Does he want story one? God rescued me. He gave me power. And I used that power to enact revenge on my brothers. That's not the story he wants to tell. He wants to tell story two. God rescued me. He gave me power. And I used that power to do for my brothers what they didn't deserve because that's what God did for me. And he gave them grace. And that's what Joseph does. He forgives them. 
And throughout this entire time, every decision Joseph is making, he's asking himself, what story do I want to tell? So let me ask you, do you see how that works? He stops. He recognizes that the decision I make right now is going to be part of my story. He knows that thousands of years later, there's going to be a Spanish pastor preaching at a church, telling his story. And he wants his story to be told correctly. And for you, what story do you want to tell? Because it's bigger than an event. It's bigger than a decision in time. It's bigger than a moment in time. And there's seasons of your life where you need to pause and ask yourself this question over and over and over again. About a month ago, I got a phone call from a friend of mine, not from this church, from far away. He lives in a different state. And he is going through the messiest divorce I've ever seen in my life. It's just crazy. He has two little kids that are involved. They're toddlers. Um, he's been married for some years, and his wife decides she wants to be a teenager again, leaves him, leaves the kids, and starts doing all sorts of stuff. And it's just become very difficult, messy divorce. There's lawyers involved. There's lawsuits. I mean, you name it. It's just so difficult. And he's calling me, and he's telling me his story of what he's going through and how hard it is and how difficult. And he, he how angry, how mad, how much hatred that he has at this moment and it's hard to listen to him he's just crying there and at the end of it he says I just don't know what to do and I told him I don't know what you should do either but here's what I do know that years from now this is going to be just a story and as difficult as this is now as devastating as it is as ugly as this is as complicated as difficult because there's little kids involved I promise you this will simply be a story. And at some point, your heart is going to be healed. And at some point, you will move on. And at some point, you're going to find stable ground. And this is going to simply be the story of your divorce. But here's the catch. You're writing it right now. So the decisions you make, the way you respond, that's going to be the story you tell. So my advice to him was write it and live it well. Write your story well. Because years from now, your toddler kids, they're going to be adults, and they're going to look at the story through the grids of an adult. And what's the story you want to tell? Do you want to tell the story that you were vindictive and you made decisions based on anger and hatred? And No, that's not the story you want to tell. What's the story you want to tell? Because for you parents, you who have kids in the house, here's the truth. When you, your story is part of your children's story, and when they tell their stories, you know where it's going to start? With you. Their story starts with your story, what you did, what you said, how you behaved, how you responded. And your story is either going to inspire your children to greatness or give them something they don't want to replicate. That's why it's important for us parents to ask this question. What story do we want to tell? And for those of us who are older and the kids are gone and we don't have to worry about that anymore, here's the thing. You still have a legacy. Your story will be told. One day people are going to be telling your story, talking about your story. What's the legacy you want to leave? That's how you make decisions. And then young people, it's so hard to realize this, but you're writing chapters of your story right now. So here's what I'm asking all of you, the whole spectrum to do. Here's my challenge to you. And this is going to seem weird. So find someone you love, you care about, your spouse, your kids, your friends, a pastor, a TLC pastor, yourself in the mirror. Pick one. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to do what Joseph did. I want you to rehearse your story out loud. Don't journal it. Don't just pray it silently. Say it out loud. There's something about words. The Bible talks about the power of words. I'm not getting into that now, but I, that's what I want you to do. I want you to rehearse your story up out loud. Up to now, what's your story? And then what's the story you want to tell? Say it out loud. I have been adopted. I was that child that was vulnerable, helpless. I needed someone to intervene, and God intervened and adopted me into his family. 
I failed, but I didn't let that failure become a part, permanent part of my life. I overcame that failure. I, I was there for my kids when they needed me most. I didn't chase after things that are not going to be eternal in value. I didn't let money become a God in my life. I didn't allow anger to rule my life. I didn't let worry or fear or stress become what dictates my decisions. I, I overcame all that. What's the story you want to tell? Because no matter what you're going through, whether it's a temptation like Joseph is facing, whether it's a decision about staying here or going there, getting a job, taking a, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, it seems like it's overwhelming. It seems like it's too complicated. I promise you, years from now, it's simply going to be a few sentences in your story. So the same advice I gave to my friends, the same advice I give to all of you, live it well. You only get one story to write. You only get to write your story. You don't get to pick what happens to you. You don't get to pick who, what cards are dealt to you. You don't get to pick like Joseph who your brothers are, who your parents are. You don't get to pick any of those details. But here's what you do have. You have a choice in how you will respond. How you will make decisions. You get to write your story. So write it well. Write a good story. Write a story that you can be proud of. Write a story that your children will be proud of. Write a story that's going to leave a legacy much bigger than just something that lasts here on earth, but a legacy that lasts for eternity. Write a good story. Write a God-honoring story, a faith-filled story. Because if you make that decision, I promise you, it's a decision you'll never regret. So what story are you going to write? Can you let me pray for you? Would you stand up? I'll pray for you. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in all of our lives. Thank you because if we're alive, if we're breathing, it's because you haven't given up on us. You have a plan for us. You have a story you're waiting for us to write. Help us, Father. Holy Spirit, come into our lives. Speak, whisper to us. Tell us what we need to do, what decisions we need to make. Give us wisdom. Give us insight. Give us courage to make the right decision even when it's hard. We can't do this without you. We're completely dependent on you. Help us connect our current situation with the future story we're going to tell and help us write a good story with the decisions we make. And as we go, would you be with us? Would you bless us? Would you make your face to shine on us? And would you give us peace? In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.